I don't know what's happening there. Um, cool, so thanks for attending. Um, before we get into the actual content of the talk, let's talk about faculty as a company. Um, we're a London-based AI company. We were founded, I think, in 2005. It will basically help you with um, whatever you need to do with AI, be that um, working out some kind of AI strategy, finding talent, or much more commonly actually implementing um, designing AI solutions for you. These kind of fall under the broad umbrella term of making AI real, ideally via um, any of the um, three, three pillars that are there. Um, and we've not been around for that long, but um, we have worked with a lot of different clients. So if you haven't worked with us, um, you will probably have worked with someone who has um, and there are some, some large names there in terms of like big engineering companies like Arab, um, McKinsey, the UK government. And when it comes to myself, uh, I've been a data scientist at faculty for a while. I was a mathematician in academia beforehand. And um, I've worked primarily for government organizations on counterterrorism, digital forensics projects when I've been here. Um, so these broadly fit into the theme of making AI real with a security purpose at least using AI to guard against the significant, um, significant risks. So that's kind of the introduction. Um, let's, let's just talk about um, the, the structure of this course, of this talk, sorry. So my intention is for the talk to be like a curated sprint through some recent happenings in the, the intersections of the fields of image forensics and machine learning. That'll include um, hopefully some, some particularly nice ideas and the recent progress, focusing on what I think like the big picture takeaways are from, from the modeling perspective. And so it will be, it's assumed that um, you know about data science and machine learning, but, but not about um, image forensics. And um, if it goes well, this talk will have like a number of bits from sort of like all of the good areas of, of data science. So we'll have like a compelling use case or argument for um, where technology can help and be impactful. Um, we'll have some like a church style preaching on best practices and um, rigor around like test and evaluation and we're going to have to eat our greens in that sense and um, then we'll also discuss some like elegant and relatively powerful ideas um, combining domain expertise and machine learning to approach this kind of tampering problem in a general way even if like um, we're not quite there in terms of like superhuman performance but maybe not far away so um, let's get on with the introduction and talk about the, the use case for um, this kind of technology. So, because as I said, I used to be a mathematician, I can't help myself, but start with the first of a couple of definitions. Um, you guys probably have a picture in your head of what image tampering is, um, and that picture is, is correct. Um, it's basically doing anything to an image which, which changes what it means, which changes um, how you would interpret an image, which alters its semantic content. And it's been with us for quite a long time. It's certainly not new. For example, um, Stalin was famous for having like former assistants and confidants um, that used to be close to him. Um, and then when they were like later just completely purged, as he was wont to do, they would be retrospectively removed from, from photographs, like in this example. We're used these days to, to tampering being done with computers via Photoshop, but forgeries like this were carried out by actual painters with like legit physical tools. Um, that is where, for instance, the term airbrush comes from. There was a man with an air powered paintbrush doing this kind of thing. And um, tampering is sort of like political integrity, that kind of thing. Um, that, that ha this has been used for political purposes in Western elections. This is an example from um, the 2004 US election, where um, I think some people were trying to stir up like a controversy around um, John Kerry, the Democratic candidate's service during the Vietnam War. They wanted to like tarnish his war record and paint him as somehow anti-war and like undeserving of the Purple Heart they received in 1968. And this, um, this is fake, unsurprisingly. Um, this sort of fake newspaper clipping, for, um, which is meant to be from a newspaper at that time, is linking him with Jane Fonda, who was like very famously anti-war, speaking at a rally. But they were never there together. Um, it's just the composite of um, you know, Jane Fonda in a completely different context. Something which is pretty cool about this example is um, the guy who took the original John Kerry picture, someone called Ken Light, which is a great name for a photographer, um, and he, like, for 50 years after taking this, um, that original picture in the 60s or whenever it was, he kept the original negatives, which meant that when this forgery came to light in 2004, when it started doing the rounds, he was, on, he was able to just come up with, like, perfect proof of authenticity of the original picture and slam down the problem quickly, which is quite an impressive way to defend democracy. Um, more people should be like him. 
And then sort of in a, a different area of public discourse, um, here's a picture from 2005, which really plays into a lot of people's perceptions of like Paris Hilton as uh, like a modern day, like Marie Antoinette of just like having no, um, you know, be completely clueless with respect to people who are worse off. But it turns out um, it's just completely false. She, she never wore that, um, that, that T-shirt. Instead, what she wore at that event was something which had stopped being desperate, which is at least a, a little bit better, has different political connotations. What interests me about this is um, you actually just can't find the real version of the photo on the left if you search online. So there's like a limited, so if, if you Google like you know, Paris Hilton stop being desperate or something, you can find other pictures from this kind of party, but like the really famous iconic hands in the air one, um, you just can't find the true version of this anymore. So there's a sense in which, and um, we don't want to get too histrionic about it, but there's a sense where like a limited sense where the truth has just been erased. You, you can't find the, the true version of this. And more recently, this is an image of um, a lady called Emma Gonzalez ripping up the, the US Constitution. And it's a very high quality forgery um, with some pretty disturbing context. So Emma was one of the, um, the survivors of the Stoneman Douglas Hill shooting. It was a high school shooting in 2018 in America when 17 people died. And what was kind of notable about this event um, or different about it to previous ones is in the immediate aftermath, she and a number of her, her other students, they just became like passionate advocates for gun control. And uh, sort of a big moment in that event was, was her giving like a memorable speech like three days after the shooting calling for reform. And um, the, inter the internet machine was, was not on its feet for long. This picture began to circulate online within, within the next month. In fact, it was actually part of a, like an impressively doctored video, probably using Adobe After Effects, but you know, it is a screenshot from a doctored video and therefore a doctored image. And um, the image is what sort of most people interacted with. Um, but the, the, original, um, the original image, the original video shoot, um, is just from a Teen Vogue magazine piece about her and her, her fellow advocates giving them some publicity. But when this Photoshop's sort of version of the image started doing the rounds online, um, there were a range of reactions from the kind of vitriolic, just by people getting angry on Twitter, to like the downright scary and deranged. So this sort of like unhinged um, Instagram post by this gentleman, um, you could definitely read this like as a threat with his the about to end comments, um, which is kind of concerning. Some some interesting context here, which just makes the whole thing a bit more confusing and upsetting, is that this Instagram account actually belongs to a man called Jesse Hughes, who's the, the front man for the band The Eagles of Death Metal, or a rock band, which you've probably heard about at some point. And I mean, maybe it was relevant to this. He, um, he was actually present at a mass shooting in 2015 in Paris. You might remember this thing called the Bataclan shooting where some, I think, terrorist gunmen um, just started open fire in a, in a concert. That was his band's concert, the Eagles of Death Metal. Um, and he found himself in, in this kind of area of opinion. And so to be fair, Jesse Hughes, like he later apologized for this, this post and deleted it. And it's highly likely that um, he just wasn't mentally well at the time of posting it. But I think that just really goes to underline the risk that um, the, the tampered images can pose in the, the new media environment that, that we've got. Um, it's kind of easy to imagine a world where um, in his state of mind at the time, he didn't finish with this kind of like, it's about to end Instagram message and took things a couple of steps further. And so, that kind of gets into a point that I want to make about like image tampering isn't new. It's been around for basically as long as images have. So it's worth asking, like, why does it feel so much riskier now? And why are we kind of more concerned about it? And I think that the, the discourse about this is a little bit unclear. Um, so the technology and the use case has always been there. Um, what's really different now is the scale and the reach of tampered images. So it's the fact that we just consume so much more information from decentralized sources than we used to and that much more of the information we consume is, is visual media. Um, that's the dominant source of increased risk, right? You just eat many, many more images than you, you would have in the 60s or 70s. And these images don't all come from television and newspapers, which are sort of vetted, which can vet their content. You just consume them from Instagram or Twitter or something. So even though like the technology for developing tampering has been improving and we, we won't really talk about, you know, GAN methods for, for generating GAN faces or for, you know, altering images, because that's not really the problem. We've had the technology for like 20 years now to create fake doctored images, which are like photorealistically can 
convincing. It's just, I mean, it is easier now, but you know, people have been able to do this if they're artistically talented for a long time. So the concern around like AI generated images and that kind of thing is a bit of a red herring. Um, the risk is existing, like the tampering technology that we have now is good enough to cause a problem, as this previous example kind of highlights. Um, the issue is really just more that it's, the risk has come from the change in how we consume, how we consume media. And so just sort of rounding out the introduction, um, you can have like a taxonomy of methods of, of tampering. You can try to do this um, by going through like well-known categories or recognizable types of tampering operation. So this, this John Kerry example was um, an example of what's called a spliced image, where content, in this case Jane Fonda, has been like cut out from one image and pasted into another. You can have what's called image inpainting, where um, somebody is just erased from an image um, by, and the background is like magically filled in in a plausible way using information from the rest of the image. The best example of this is Photoshop's content aware fill, which I believe works for a really cool algorithm called patch match invented by a guy who was sponsored by and then went on to work for, for Adobe. And um, you can also have a copy move um, or cloning forgery where like content in an image is just duplicated and pasted somewhere else. And so that's happened here with um, these um, like exhaust clouds and the actual rocket path itself. Though it's also the case, this is like, um, you can see there's like a bit of a dot in the, um, the middle cloned rocket exhaust trail here. So this has been copy move with some other stuff happening as well. And there's also just like much more subtle retouching where the objects in the image don't change, but their appearance, like the properties you associate to them um, do change. I kind of like to think about this as a second order rather than first order tampering. So you've changed the properties of what's going on rather than what's actually going on. And so what's happening here is like, it's a bit, it's a bit more subtle than just normal standard tampering, but it's potentially still damaging if it's applied at large scale to change people's opinions, right? If you had media control or you could see somebody releasing images of a political candidate that were tampered to make them look very frail and weak in an election, which might, you know, bias people against voting for them, for example. So what I'd like to argue for as a consequence of this is that tools targeting like just a specific subset of tampering techniques, if you were to build like a splicing detector by itself, or something like this, um, these can be helpful from a technical level because they help you make progress in um, an isolated area. But it's hard to think of a use case, there, there are probably some, but it's not that easy to think of a use case where you can guarantee that you'll only encounter one type of tampering technique done in one kind of way. You'll often just, um, you know, what you see in practice is people make images and they, they might doctor them and they'll use multiple techniques at once in some previously unforeseen combination of ways, or they might do something which just doesn't fit into one of the categories that we discussed. Um, it's worth thinking about things like Instagram filters and stuff like that in that context, which is sort of retouching, but retouching done in a different way where you don't, you know, you're not doing it manually with a Photoshop brush. So the point is that if you can't guarantee what type of tampering technique you're up against in advance, it's not really optimal to, to test for isolated techniques. Cool. Um, so this is a question that I want to pose at the start, sort of round out the introduction, which um, we won't answer yet for another, I don't know, 20 slides or so, but the question is, if we want to detect um, or build something which can detect arbitrary kinds of tampering techniques, um, we need to be able to pose the problem in like a machine understandable way first, right? Um, so the question to think about is, can we model this general tampering problem in an algorithmic way? And the difficulty here is that the definition I gave at the start defines tampering just in terms of like semantic content or humans understand, which we are not at the stage of getting computers to do this for us yet. Cool. So that was kind of the sell for, um, you know, why is it especially relevant to think about dealing with tampering now, to think about being able to detect tampered images. Now I want to go through the like um, eat your greens phase of the talk where um, we just talk about things that you want to be careful with and watch out for if you are, if you're working with this in this space. And my basic take home memory, which is sort of like written, so written in letters of fire on my slides is, um, don't really trust your data set, at least without a lot of investigation. And what that means is that it can be surprisingly easy to construct data sets for this task, which are just broken uh, without really realizing. 
and we'll kind of see what that means um, of our cautionary tale. So this is the, the Cassia data set, um, which um, sort of reminds me of a tiger's Instagram feed, but it's just a set of images with a variety. It involves like in-painting and um, mostly splicing operations with images, you know, like this tiger spliced into a variety of different contexts. And um, it was built specifically for the purposes of developing and evaluating image forensics algorithms. Um, and it's got about 12,000 images in it. In fact, in the, the paper which introduces this, um, they introduced two data sets at once. We're talking about the second one because it's what everyone uses. Um, and so it has, you know, seven over 12 balance of um, authentic. Well, okay, it has 7,000 authentic, 5,000 tempered images. And the, 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 the data set curators, the author of the paper that introduced it, um, they did this because they, they had identified that existing data sets were just out of date and unrealistic in terms of um, featuring only very simple manipulations done to just a small number of images. They said that this isn't like, this isn't really suitable for evaluating algorithms which we'd like to use in the wild. So let, let's try and fix that to come through with something better. And they went about this the right way. Um, so they took care to, to make things, they tried to go back to the right way, but they took care to make things at least like vaguely realistic um, and to simulate some, some real world conditions. And if you're kind of protesting that you, you don't think are, are tigers from a couple of slides earlier, uh, I mean, are okay and that you can sort of immediately spot the, the, these tigers are photoshopped in. In, in the, the data set author's defense, it should be borne in mind that producing like high quality photoshopped images is a laborious process with like, it, it takes a lot of time and requires expert work, at least until the technology to do so improves a lot. And so if you're gonna generate 5,000 tempered images, um, that kind of quality, like um, that will take a lot of time to produce. You'll need a lot of resources to do better than this. And so the creators of this data set had exactly the right intentions. They wanted to do the right thing. But um, in fact, it didn't take long after the data set was released. The data set was published, I think in 2013. But as early as 2014, people were identifying some issues. And what you find if you do um, an investigation of this data set is that um, the different classes of tampered and untampered images have like unnecessarily but radically different post-processing histories. And what that means in this context is that um, untampered images, like almost all of them, like 99% or whatever, have um, are JPEG compressed, which is this lossy compression format. And only 54 of them are saved as, as BMP images, which is a lossless save format. But for tampered images, it's much more, um, like what's two of three, like two thirds of the images, not two thirds of the images, 40%, um, only 40% of the images are JPEGs and the rest are TIFF files, which is another lossless format. And so what that means is that because JPEG compression is, is, is a lossy compression format, it introduces artifacts into images when you, when you save them this way. If you've seen like, um, you know, very poor quality, you know, many times resaved JPEG, you'll see this like blocky pattern in it, which is visually apparent. And this happens in all JPEG images to some degree. It's just a bit less noticeable to humans. Um, but a tell which is particularly noticeable to machines is that um, one of the images color channels is just subsampled. It has like only a quarter of the values it usually would, for instance. Whereas TIFF and BMP images don't introduce, the, those file formats don't introduce any kind of compression artifacts. And so what that means is that if you're using this data set to, to evaluate your, your tampering detection algorithm, well, um, you can actually do a pretty good job with like a very low false positive rate and a decent true positive rate just by building a JPEG detector, which obviously is like, um, that would be a fail because your, your algorithm isn't going to do anything um, that's useful in deployment in real life, but it will perform well on this data set. And this is kind of the sense in which the data set's broken, right? And um, you can do well on it without this transferring in any sense to, to real world performance that you might care about. And it actually gets a bit worse than that because if you zoom in on um, the quality factor that's used to save um, 
these, these JPEG images, then you find that um, the quality factor of fingerprints, tampered versus untampered JPEGs, almost uniquely, in the sense that um, they have almost completely different disjoint, non-overlapping quality factors, as this, this bar chart demonstrates. Presumably that's because changing the quality factor every time you save a photoshopped image is kind of laborious and a pain. But um, it means that if you give yourself access to this information, and there are algorithms which will let you infer this, like to, to estimate what the quality factor of an image is, then you can build an almost perfect classifier using just this information, right? The only thing you, you would, um, if you look at the sort of the 92 reading there, that's kind of like the only thing you would get wrong, right? So you can build an exceptionally good classifier if you use that information, but it's completely orthogonal to the phenomenon that we actually care about, which is the existence of tampering. And so the authors of this sort of um, tactfully named analysis paper, um, they show that what they did, they took um, a tampering algorithm, which at the time was seen as kind of state of the art, and which had been evaluated, well, a tampering detection algorithm, which had been evaluated on this, this Casio data set, and was quoting like a 71% accuracy. And they showed that if you take that algorithm and evaluate it, I think even if you train and then evaluate it, but certainly if you evaluate it on a data set where this kind of um, compression factor problem is fixed, the performance just drops to like 55% accuracy, which is just a bit above the 50% baseline. So here yeah, there was a real situation where um, people were using this data set and it, it mis misled them in terms of results. And if you remove um, this um, sort of accidental correlation of um, processing history with, with tampered status, your performance just drops away. And so Cassia as a data set was published in 2013 and that analysis was published in 2014. So um, this was spotted pretty quickly by some people in the literature. Um, I think this is probably an example of people coming from the machine learning world and deciding that a new data set was needed and constructing it and then domain experts helpfully pointing out some of the issues with it. But um, that hasn't stopped people from using this data set like with, with wild abandon. So these, these 57 citations since 2019, they account for like more than half of the data set citations sort of ever. So as the field has grown, people have just been happily, if you Google, um, you know, like what data sets can I use for, for image forensics or something like this? This is one of the data sets that is proposed to you. And then you might just take it, download it and think jobs are good. And, but then your, you know, basically your results would be um, just invalid for, for the reasons that we've discussed. And so I think this, like the sort of the happy uptake of this data set, despite these problems, is just testament to the fact that um, thinking about data isn't really as glamorous as coming up with new, new ideas for machine learning models, but it's very important in this situation. And what's kind of particularly hard in this context is that you're gonna struggle to detect if your data set is broken or not by just doing visual data investigation. So it's usually very good practice in data science to sort of look at your data a lot to explore it, to think about what's going on, um, which you should do, but you need to do it in a different way for, um, for tampering data sets, because it's, it's hard for you to see um, visually, like is this J JPEG compressed with a high quality factor versus um, is it not? Has this image been histogram equalized, for instance? Is it actually extracted from a video file? Um, has it been resized? These are all things which could potentially break your data set in the same way, but which um, you would struggle to spot from a visual check. And so the, the point of this discussion is it's not entirely to point the finger at the authors of this data set. Like they were trying to solve, they had correctly identified and made a, a, you know, a sincere attempt to solve a real problem. The point that I would take away is that like this could happen to you. Um, you should be very careful to avoid potentially similar issues if you construct either your own data set um, for evaluating or training a model in this area or if you use somebody else's. The, the sort of the previous fingerprinting factor that we had was, was to do with compression, but it could easily come from something like image resizing, for example, which you could you know, apply as, as data augmentation during training. So that's a risk to be concerned about. And another situation where um, this kind of, um, this issue could rear its head again is something which is a bit more um, 
it's receiving a lot of attention, the attention in the community at the moment, even though it's probably a threat for the future rather than now, is in the detection of like neural network generated images. And the point here is that a workflow that you might typically go through if you're building your, um, your like GAN image detector is you might have a GAN or a number of different GANs, which you train yourself on um, you know, a large data set of images, and then you would generate GAN output from these and um, then you would build your classifier, jobs are good in. But um, the risk here is that basically all of the data sets that are commonly available for computer vision problems have been subject to some degree of JPEG compression because um, they're originally retrieved from Flickr where like it's easiest to obtain the JPEG copy of something. And people aren't really refreshing these data sets because they're hard to collect, right? You're kind of stuck with, with what Google gives you. So they all feature some degree of compression. And then if you, if you build your generative model that generates images or even just, yeah, you know, produce, takes in an image and outputs another image, what it will output will be free of compression artifacts, right? There will be no JPEG compression applied to this. It will just have a structure determined by the network weights. And so if you're not careful and you just then take that raw data and classify it as compared to the, the original data set that you trained your model on, for example, that's another situation where you could get very good performance just by building a JPEG detector. Now, I've seen at least one instance of um, a recent paper reporting like great performance in GAN detection, where this potential issue was a risk in that they happily said that, you know, we trained our models and we produced the images and then we built a classifier to separate them from the set that the GAN was trained on. And there's no, there's no attention or mention made to the fact that one would want to be careful to, to avoid this problem. So the good news is that um, the field has recently started to like, people sort of woke up to this and the field has decided to, to deal with this kind of issue. And some high quality data sets have um, just started to become available. And in particular, um, the US government, which like, understandably has a you know, vested interest in um, the image tampering problem not becoming too much of a big deal. Um, they ran, uh, they funded and ran several image forensics competitions, which I think actually paid for some of the research that we'll talk about um, in a second. And these competitions came with like associated high quality development data sets for building algorithms, but also like held out test sets, which weren't released until the end of the competition. And these have like tens of thousands of, of tampered images in them, maybe more. Um, I think it might be hundreds of thousands actually, I just don't remember. And we said earlier that you need like a lot of resources to produce thousands of genuinely high quality photoshopped images. And like the US government is a good candidate for this. They have a lot of resources. And if you're not a nation state, um, but you need data, the alternative is to either crowdsource or make high quality synthetic data. And so something that's just recently come online is um, Reddit's PS Battles data set, which I think has something like 90,000 high quality forgeries, um, which come out of this weekly competition that I think is weekly, that the subreddit holds to make like am amusing tampered images. And I think it's fair to say that like a lot of the progress that we'll discuss for the remainder of the talk has been enabled or spurred on by the creation and availability of the data sets that are discussed on this slide and some other ones. I feel like we should give a shout out to NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology here, because it's not the first time they've done something like this. Um, they're responsible ultimately for the, the MNIST data set, which was like so influential for image classification research. And here is yet another situation where they, they saw a need for like high quality data, which the research community probably wasn't gonna provide to itself. And they did realize that this was kind of like a blocker and then they just went ahead and provided it. Um, and lo and behold, that has like unlocked and made possible some, some research since. So that's, um, that's a very good story, basically. I don't want to say they're quite like unsung heroes, but they have made like a significant contribution here. Cool. So running in plenty of time, actually. Um, I almost wonder if I have to stop and answer some questions now. Um, I will not because we started a bit late. Um, so. After covering some of the things which should go wrong, should be watched out for, um, let's just for the remainder of the talk, look at some interesting approaches for, for tackling this problem. And I want to return to the question that we asked at the start of the talk, or at least at the end of the introduction, which is how can you, how can you model this kind of you know, tampering, this general tampering problem as something that you can 
approach in a systematic algorithmic way. And hopefully what we spoke about in the preceding sections has convinced you that um, there are at least some like, you should be pretty cautious about using an out of the box a supervised learning technique whereby it's just going to infer an implicit modeling of, of what tampering is from, from data. Um, this can be quite risky because it's going to be hard for you to know that um, you have really um, fit to the right property of your images rather than something else which was hard for you to see. Um, and this kind of thing, if you just like, you know, have a data set containing spiced images or impainted images, it takes us away from the goal of detecting general tampering techniques that we mentioned earlier. It also makes maybe some strong recommend like requirements from the data that you're using as well if you need to locate exactly in an image where tampering happens with a mask or something like that. And so here's an approximately automatable definition of a different way to think about tampering which you could use to attack this problem. So rather than talking about things in terms of like semantic content which is this fluffy only really human understandable term we can say that maybe we, we can be mathematicians about this and define an image to be tampered if after it was initially acquired through a camera or something different bits of the image feature different post-processing histories so this rests on this well sorry different processing histories this rests on the notion of like the, or makes use of the notion of the processing history of an image which we used earlier without really defining uh, roughly that's the sum of everything that's happened to get this image from the real world directly to your computer so that includes like the camera that originally took the image the kind of camera subsequent like tweaking or rebalancing that might have happened to the image in photoshop if you're a photographer be it like you know presumably innocuous and like artifacts from um you know compression when you've saved it in a lossy manner for example and what's nice about this definition is it just immediately proposes to you a strategy for trying to, to detect tampering in general, which is that if you can learn to, to recognize or understand, um, to read off the processing history of an image from, from pixel values, then there's a hope that we can actually identify the processing history used in different locations of uh, different areas of an image and um, detect tampered images accordingly because they will have one which isn't homogenous. That's all very well and good, um, but I've replaced like one intangible concept for another. So this is kind of only useful if we can quantify, um, you know, if we can actually quantify or extract this kind of information like processing history. And um, the great news is that we kind of can. Um, so the, the, the big win, which comes from like domain experts in this field, the people who are working on um, image tampering before machine learning came in is that there are use cases and arguments for, for this being possible. So images often contain a secret signal which contains this kind of information. And the way you should think about this is you should model your like mental mo model of um, an image that you see on your computer is it should be this combination of some platonic true version of the scene that you observe and a device specific kind of noise pattern, which you can think of as like corruption or noise in, in the Gaussian sense. And the point here is that the, the sort of true version of the scene that you see is um, independent of the acquisition history. And the, the noise pattern is kind of like independent of the content of the image, only really depends on the acquisition pipeline, which is not, it's not 100% true assumption, but it's quite a good one. So you could think of this like platonic true version of the scene as what would happen if you um, took that image and then did all possible like processing pipelines to it, used all possible cameras and then averaged them or something like that um, to end up with something which didn't have any kind of fingerprint of its, its acquisition process. And the, the noise pattern would then be just the acquisition process that, um, is this left over here by a specific um, post acquisition history. And so the, the hope here or the strategy is that by extracting, if you, if you, if you can get such a noise pattern, by extracting um, the right statistics from it, 
just in the way that for like a one dimensional distribution, you might just compute moments of that, that probability distribution, like the mean, the variance, the kurtosis and skewness or whatever. Um, eventually these will just like uniquely define that distribution, that probability distribution. Here we have a, a higher dimensional empirical distribution, but the hope is that if you could just, if you could extract that distribution, then you just need to extract a bunch of statistics for it to the point where you can like um, fingerprint it uniquely and therefore fingerprint that images processing history uniquely. This is well, probably the most concept dense slide, but let's, let's if, if, if you believe in this idea, um, let's see how you might use this, or in fact, how the field has used it um, to build some tampering detection technology by walking through an example. So I'm actually gonna speed up a bit. Um, so let's look at one way that this is done. Um, if we take an image that we're, we're interested in um, investigating for potential potential presence of tampering, we can start off by just dividing it into many, many patches. And then for each patch, you examine it separately to try and identify that its processing history or a fingerprint of its processing history. And to do that, we, uh, via um, a process that we will talk about in a couple of slides, but not here, um, we'll extract this kind of aforementioned noise pattern and then um, compute like a relatively comparatively low dimensional set of features by extracting these statistics, which effectively earmark the, the noise pattern and therefore the, the processing history of the patch. We're not going to go into like what those statistics are, how you would compute that, that low dimensional feature set, um, but it's used via something called a co-occurrence matrix, which you might have occurred, sorry, encountered in, in NLP. And once you've done this, then um, you basically just have a bunch of data points, one data point corresponding to each patch with a set of low dimensional features. And you're then interested in spotting ones which look unusual, which are you know, different compared to the rest of the image. And that's just um, a, a novelty detection, anomaly detection um, problem. You could also maybe use clustering. So you can then just to your data set of, of, of patch data points, apply your favorite unsupervised method like an isolation forest or um, an elliptic envelope or something and assign a like an anomaly score to every every patch in your image and doing this will let you compute this kind of heat map um, which you can then examine for clear visual evidence that um, the gentleman on the left was in fact um, was in fact never there in the first place so this is a high level walkthrough of um, one of the leading algorithms and this stuff before the advent of deep learning and um, the, the splice buster algorithm and it's a good example of this like quite general modeling pipeline, which is like we get to the following methodology, which is given an image, you can extract a noise pattern for it, from it via a procedure that we'll just, we're just about to talk about. You can then split it into patches and compute features for all of these patches. And once you have these, um, you can use them with some kind of aggregation step to make a prediction. We just spoke about predicting a heat map, but you could for localization purposes, but you could also think about you know, just predicting a binary classification decision. So um, in principle, you could improve any one of these three stages independently from the others, which is exactly what, we'll, exactly what we're going to do. So um, the most mysterious step from the procedure that we went through beforehand was how to extract these noise patterns in the first place, right? So let's, let's just zoom in and focus on that. And in 2015, um, when, for instance, this, this spice plus drug that was proposed, um, we really only had low tech solutions from, from digital signal processing, where you try and work out the noise value at a pixel by, um, it's not so obvious from this equation, but what this boils down to is um, you work out the, the noise value of that pixel by subtracting, um, computing like a complicated linear average of pixel values in that kind of neighborhood. A simple way of thinking about this is that you could just, um, take the actual version of the image and subtract like a denoised version from it, like Gaussian, um, like a, a, a Gaussian blurred version. That wouldn't give you exactly this equation, but um, it gives you something from the same family. If you work with time series, this particular equation here um, should be like familiar to you as something that you might do to make a time series stationary. Um, we're doing the same thing here. We're just applying a differencing step to try and make the image a stationary distribution. In this instance, we're using a third order filter. Um, and this is okay, um, it, it's a big benefit it has, is it's very cheap to do computationally, but it's not perfect. You can see in this kind of example that 
um, the direction of the filter, the fact that we take differences um, in a way which is like aligned with the, the coordinate axes of the image means that information in the image, which is also strongly aligned in those directions, can leak through into the output. So here, because I think the filter is being taken with a difference running up and down in the image, but I forget if it's up and down or left to right. Um, that means that information in the image, like lines which go up and down, strongly leak through into the output, as you can see in the staff that the, the kid is holding here, the, the cross and the, the flag in the background. So this doesn't really fit the model that we proposed earlier, where this, this noise pattern should contain information only about the processing history, but not about the actual scene content in the image. So that was what we had to do um, before the, the, the glorious advent of, of deep learning. Um, and what you can do now, of course, is just use a neural network to do this. So this wouldn't really be a tech talk unless like coming close to the end of it, we had a, a hairy neural network diagram. So this is, um, this is the, the, the map of um, a neural network that's designed for this task, that had to extract this noise pattern, imagine it to be called noise print. And so the authors of this paper set about working out how you could extract these in quite a smart, functional way. So the network is trained to generate a noise pattern given an image referred to as a noise print, and it's kind of fully convolutional. So you can pass in an image of any size and get out um, the corresponding noise print of the right size. Um, and basically, the network's trained on a, a database of a very high resolution and tampered images. No tampered images are used during training. Um, each taken, well, all taken by a variety of different camera models. And then from each of these images, you extract a number of patches at training time. And these are fed into the network in batches, where a batch will contain multiple patches from multiple images from multiple cameras. And then the network is simply encouraged to, to map patches which are taken from the same location in images, which are taken by the same camera to the same value. And otherwise they're mapped to, to different values. So the label of an image is um, both the camera that it comes from and the position in that, in that image. Sorry, the, the label of a patch is the camera that it comes from and its position in the parent image. And if the label agree, the network is encouraged to map them to the same value and otherwise to make them different. They use the location in, like, in this label because um, domain expertise from image forensics tells you that these patterns um, aren't quite spatially homogenous. Um, they're actually periodic instead. And so you don't want your, um, your noise pattern to be completely random across the, the distribution of the image. In fact, it has some structure that we'll see. But the point here is that um, they, they, they provide the same label to patches which come from different images with different high level content, so long as they have the same acquisition history, the same, the same camera which took them. And so you can believe plausibly that this should train you to spot and this should train you to train a model to extract something like a noise pattern. And it turns out these do very well at that. So this is an example of, of a noise print computed for the image that we had before. Um, you can see this like strongly periodic nature in the output because of this kind of requirement that they put in, um, that patches should only be mapped to the same kind of value if they come from the same location as well as, as, well as camera. But um, what's good here is that you can see that we've clearly, um, we're fitting this, this modeling assumption we made earlier much better, that um, we've suppressed all of the high level semantic content of the image. The only thing that's really leaked out here for us to notice is that it's now clear that that picture in the background was actually Photoshopped in, right? That just has a different post-processing history to the rest of the image. These, th these things, these noise prints, they're not perfect in that the same kind of issue we saw before can happen leaking through, but it happens much less. And they lead to models which perform better than ones um, based on this previous residual filter. So we can go back to this, this sort of three-step pipeline that we had before, and we can just replace previous residual extraction um, with the computation of a noise print, but everything else in terms of then extracting statistics from this distribution and doing some anomaly detection is the same. And this is an example from the, the group that um, created this stuff's lab. Um, you can see it produces some very impressive output where um, you can do this to an image with, with, with no label, no input. It's a purely unsupervised procedure, but correctly localizes um, an instance of like high quality tampering. And this workflow gets around like quite a lot of issues that we're concerned around earlier in the 
at no point during the sort of the making of this, this heat map um, was a tempered image used. So there's no risk of overfitting to a tempered data set or some peculiarity with it. Um, that's kind of gone. And the, the workflow that we spoke about was, you know, in general applicable to any kind of localized tampering. So we're not specific to something like, like spicing. There's like a very satisfying inference model here. Um, you feel like you know intuitively what, what your model is doing. So it, this kind of opens the door to workable general tampering detection methods. And so finally, just in like two minutes, um, the, the final next couple of slides discuss like some recent developments in optimizing, well, a recent development in optimizing the last two stages of this process, the computation of the features from patches and then the prediction. Um, and in fact, it optimizes both of these stages at once. And so this is from um, a paper by the same group that produced this original noise print network. Um, well, I should have said earlier and did not say here that um, this Siamese noise print network, it's the product of one group, but interestingly, at the same time, about three different people, three other groups from different places came out with very similar ideas, training Siamese nets to um, recognize the, to extract features which identify only the processing history of images. So this is clearly like an idea that's in the air in this image forensics field. But um, yeah, so on this slide, we're discussing a paper which actually, um, it was released on archive last September, and it turns out that it was only, it was just published last month. And they introduce a, a neural net, which as we've seen on the previous workflow, splits images into patches. And then they're fed into this pipeline, which is like a, a continuous end-to-end -end joined up version of the workflow that we've just spoken about. So its architecture mirrors this extract, compute, predict strategy we've discussed. And this like green feature extraction stage um, includes the computation of a noise print for each patch. Um, and once these are computed, like features are extracted using, um, I think something like exception that, that architecture and pooled and used for classification. Um, one thing which, so this network is trained in like a supervised modality, you use both tempered and untempered images, but crucially they, they show that it generalizes. And the thing to note is that um, the whole thing is trained together all at once rather than separately. So the network, like in particular network updates during training are made using um, all of the patches extracted from an image at once rather than one by one. So this actually is like a neural network version of the anomaly detection or clustering strategy that we spoke about before, but it happens at every stage of training, which means that your network makes a tampered or non-tampered decision for an image, not by identifying a tampered patch within the image, but somehow considering the relationship between all patches instead, which is, that's kind of a, a very high level explanation of a quite a sophisticated architecture. But the takeaway I would have you sort of use from this is that they are still just computing. Um, it's not represented so much on this, this diagram, but they do highlight it in the paper. Um, they're extracting these noise prints, these noise residuals, and then using them to make a smart aggregate decision as to the, the tampered nature of an image. And I think this is my final content slide. Um, they get stunning results with this. Um, they beat the nearest competitor by about 20% on a very hard test. Um, they prove that they can generalize to like six different forgery data sets, including a number of the DARPA NIST Medifor data sets we spoke about beforehand, which were just completely unseen during training. So they've, 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 they've beaten this problem of overfitting to a particular data set. And it's worth noting that like, so they beat the competitor by like 20%. I think the image net moment with AlexNet was like a 23% improvement. So this is like that level of, of performance jump. Um, the next best competitor, which I think was another deep learning approach, is that 0.69 area under the curve. Um, the noise print pipeline that we spoke about beforehand, where you would use just a simple anomaly detection setup, um, actually came in like a very close third at a 0.68. So everybody that does well at the moment in image processing is following this like extract noise pattern, compute features, prediction methodology. That's something which I'd have you take away from this. Cool. So it's like a summary um, kind of impact slide, 47 minutes in. Um, like an area into the, so the first point I guess is that you should take extreme care when constructing data sets for model training or evaluation, because you could shoot yourself in the foot and not know because it's hard to look. It's hard to notice just by looking at your images. Um, so that should um, 
I would highly recommend instead you have to ask for access to these data sets often they're not publicly available but it's very well much worth getting hold of some of the new higher quality data sets which have been released and the second takeaway is that um, things are really changing very quickly in this field so everything that we've spoken about all of the machine learning stuff is really about two years old or less and they really seem to be forging this path towards the ability to detect generally tampered images thanks to this kind of like pleasing combination of intelligent model design and deep learning and to be fair like an area under the curve of um, 0 0.2 it's not like a 0.99 or something um, which you might be used to from other image classification tasks but progress has been like astonishingly fast so you might not um, you know, you can't build something with like a high true positive rate and a super high false negative rate, which you might need if you want to like, you know, just pipe Reddit into your tampering detector to, to look for tampering. So it's not quite suitable for automated practical use, but we're really not that far away, right? It wouldn't be surprising if in six months time, someone came out with a paper which was achieving like a 0.95 or something. And then later a 0.99, you can get into that kind of that kind of regime. So um, it feels like we're just at the, the like the gradient point of progress here in the field. Cool. So that was all of my content um, in 49 rather than 45 minutes. Um, and I'm now happy to. Um, I'll read questions, um, the eight which have been posted, but do feel free to um, write down other ones as well. Let me just try and work out how to bring up these questions. There we go. Um, gonna get to, I'm going to go through these in order. Thanks for your question, Tim. Would malicious actors make tampering images typically be careful relating to the image compression point? Um, the, the skills of real world image tamperers relative to the, the data sets authors. Um, so a malicious actor who is actively thinking about trying to deceive the forensics community would be trying to make steps to sort of hide, um, hide what they were doing. And you can do things like try to fake the post-processing history of your image, which is something we haven't spoken about. Um, the US government know about this and they're on the watch out for them. And so um, they actually included some of this stuff in these data sets they released. So if you perform well on um, these data sets we spoke about, which this model that we ended the talk with did, um, you are dealing with that problem to some extent. I make um, no opinion on the thought of real world image tamperers as opposed to the people who designed this Cassia data set. Um, there's a very wide range of skills there. Um, on to your question, Richard. Um, what are the skills shortages in digital forensics? Um, writing good code. Um, <laughs> that's the quick one. If you look at, um, so what is good and like, you know, people should be praised for this. What is good about some of the research I spoke about is that they are posting all of their code, at least for evaluation, so that you can run, you might not be able to train the same model they trained, but you can at least run the model they produced. Um, so that's a good thing, but the code base is not in a state that you'd want to use in a production environment. So I would say software engineering, basically. Um, I don't know which organizations, I don't think that we're at the stage where you would have a company yet just providing an automated, very general purpose solution for this kind of thing in the, the manner that, that you're describing. I've not heard of SANA Labs, so I can't comment on them. The percentage of digital forensics markets, which is law enforcement, um, I can tell you for sure that um, they're interested in this. Um, other places which could be interested in the same sort of thing, for example, are um, basically any company that needs to do that could be worried about content forgery or authentication with respect to, um, like, let's say you're submitting receipts to prove that you paid for something, right? That's, um, you know, the people who run that app on your phone might be concerned about checking to make sure that you haven't tampered your receipt. Um, your question, Stephen, deepfakes have an internally consistent noise pattern across the image. Um, disagree with um, your conclusion there. The, I, it's not presumably the case that they have an internally consistent noise pattern, I don't think. Certainly, if you if you train, um, if you just have like a simple, um, the expert for this is on the call, so he's going to butt in if I get this wrong. But you, you train, like if you have a simple encoder decoder thing, um, there's no real reason you would optimize to remember the noise pattern because it contribute, it doesn't really contribute a lot to your, like you, the error metric that you're using. So there's no reason you would expect this to be consistently reproduced. Um, and in fact, you could argue that 
um, different in the real world, different frames would feature noise patterns with a certain degree of like, random variation due to camera sensor noise. And you could argue that it's likely to be the case that um, that your um, your deep fake method doesn't reproduce this. And in fact, actually, I guess the, the simpler answer to your question is that um, if you read the papers, which um, if you read the original noise print paper, they show this actually does work on, um, you do have to train a video camera model specific version of noise print, but this does work to detect instances of face swapping. I think they have quite a cool, um, there's quite a cool GIF to this effect on movie online. What are the key tampering problems faced by consumers of satellite imagery? Um, to be honest, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, I would assume the same tampering problems that um, other people encounter in terms of faking buildings to be there when they're not perhaps or something like this. But um, I think it probably is largely affected by um, the consume by who the consumer is, right? So if you're the thing is that if you're the um, at the moment, I think with satellite imagery, we probably still fall within um, this situation where the content providers are trusted, right? So, I mean, this might change, this will change now because the satellite industry is exploding. But certainly uh, like five years ago or something, everybody who was posting, like all of the people providing satellite images to you were governments or something. So, and like, you know, wealthy governments. So most of these would be trustworthy and you would trust the satellite images they're providing to you. Not sure how to answer your question more than that. Um, anonymous attendee. Um, talk to some of the business use issues or use cases that your clients have justified from an investment in this sort of project. Um, they have all been interested in um, destabilizing the political process and um, getting advanced warning on um, people uh, engaging disinformation campaigns within their country. I'm probably not going to comment on it more than client confidential than that, but they're, they're very interested in like my experiences principally with actors who are concerned about the potential political ramifications of this, stuff like that. Um, how different does this look algorithmically to video tampering? Um, so this is very different. So the difference, I guess, with one of the difficulties with still image tampering is that different people can Photoshop or tamper different images in very different ways. You have this human in the loop element. You have that much less with video tampering because nobody has time to sit down and manually doctor by hand every frame of a video. So the range of possible ways or algorithms you can use to tamper a video is much smaller, which means that a supervised approach can make more sense. Right. So um, everything that we've discussed here is applicable in principle to video tampering. And in some sense, it's like the most, you know, it's an aesthetically pleasing thing to do because it makes relatively few assumptions. But video tampering is an example because basically the space of acquisition, like the things you can do to a video are smaller than the things you can do to an image because you don't want to modify every frame by hand. That means that a supervised approach can be more appropriate. Uh, thanks for your question, Ben. Um, would these neural network approaches struggle to detect photoshopping of images taken from the same camera, the same photo shoot, same lighting conditions? So like if I tried really hard to make things match up. So the thing that you would detect here, um, and this goes back to um, this step in the, the, the training pipeline for this noise print app, um, this noise print algorithm, they made sure to, um, they made sure to sort of bake into this that noise prints are not spatially homogenous. So a noise print has this sort of periodic pattern. So even if I take, um, if I take an image and I want to, I take two images with the same camera and the same conditions and I want to spice content from one into the other, I will need to make sure that this underlying noise print pattern will line up with the right periodicity of the other one. Otherwise you could in principle detect this. And you could do that if you are able to compute noise prints yourself and things like that, but you need to make sure that your network is the same one that the other guy is using. So it's possible, like it's possible to, to, you know, people are directly exploring this, the sort of like adversarial approach to this stuff is in its infancy. So like it's philosophically possible, but they've taken some pretty reasonable steps to prevent against that. How would these noise print techniques work on, on an, an authentic image taken of a printout of a tampered image? Um, yeah, they wouldn't, but, but I, I don't think they would. That's an excellent question. So at the end of the day, um, manipulations to images can lose information. I mean, it, so 
it's not the case, like it's just not possible that for, to be able to reconstruct the entire tampering history of any image no matter what's been done to it um in your example you could argue that actually what you're talking about is um as you say it's an authentic image of a tampered image so because it's authentic you would not detect anything but yes that would be um a way around this um, i don't know of any method which would be able to detect what was going on there really On to your next question, Richard. Um, catastrophe modeling, i.e. floods, earthquakes, forest fire. Catastrophe modeling images are increasingly valued by the financial services. Is this market material for image forensics providers? Yes, um, people who are looking over, um, as I said with this earlier example of like, you would want to check um, to see whether a receipt that has been submitted to your expenses platform is actually like a doctored image or something. If I am an insurance company, I certainly want to make sure that you haven't just photoshopped the picture of your house to be on fire or something like that. And so um, this is something that they could be concerned with. Absolutely. Cool. Um, nice. Um, so that, that was all, all 12 of the questions. Um, if anybody else has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I think we can wrap up the call five minutes over time. I'm not sure I know how to correctly um, stop or disengage this call. It's going to be interesting. All right, nice. In which case, um, I, I think that's probably the end of it for questions. So um, thank you very much for your time, guys. Feel free to, um, oh, I would not be doing my duty to the company if I didn't finish on the contact us slide. Um, yeah, if you're interested in uh, talking more about this, then uh, do get in touch. Otherwise, thanks a lot for your attention. I hope this was interesting. <laughs>